All right, so it's uh, October 25th. It's my 24th day <coughs> not drinking sober October. Started started a day late. Um, update on that: the the not drinking is really going great. The only thing is, I am probably smoking a few more cigarettes, and um, I am still puffing some on um, CBD, um, but no weed. Um, and drinking tons of kombucha and so on, and I've gotten a habit over the last week to drink a Red Bull. But I did have one day where my head started to burn, which is a problem I used to have for several years, several years back. <clears throat> Excuse me, which went away when I started drinking every day. So I was concerned about that coming back, and that hasn't. What has come, come as I talked about before, is that big inf in infected cyst in my arm. It's it's gotten quite a bit smaller, um, but it's there. It's all there. It's very small and very deep, and it has caused my entire arm, <laughs> except for my hand, still pretty good. But I think it's even maybe. But like from here, and now it had stopped right at about my shoulder for a while, but like my whole shoulder and part of the back of my neck, it's all screwed up. The ligaments, the tendons, the visceral fabric-y, I don't know what it's called, but um, that's all really struggling, all of it, just all through here. Sometimes when I lift my arm up, it's almost like... My whole arm has this like pulse of pain and then feels like it's asleep. It's a total mess, but I was really concerned about that cyst exploding and that didn't happen. So maybe with time and if I drastically change my consumption. Also, um, I've been coughing more when I smoke lately. Well, I've had a smoker's cough for a while, but I've been coughing a lot more, and when I take drags of cigarettes, it doesn't hurt, but it makes me, gives me a tickle and I cough. Um, I mean, I'm really a mess, so this, for me, Sober October has to be step one, and then I will need to aggressively take step two, and I'm afraid of that too, I don't know what it will be, because I got a lot of steps I gotta take. And then on the other front, yeah, my knee, which has hurt for a while, I never really talk much about it because it's just kind of this nagging pain, hoping it would go away, but I've had it for, I don't know, six months, a year, somewhere in there, and maybe longer. Uh, and just last week, or it's been a week, a week and a couple days, that has started to swell. And what it feels to me is like that I have some kind of callousy thing maybe like under my kneecap. And that's just kind of been there just from being on my knees at work and so on. But now that has started to swell. And I don't know if it's like some sort of sympathetic reaction with everything that's going on in my arm. But like my, whole, you know, my right side of my body is like a complete mess. And last week it was so bad, I could, I could barely walk on it at all. Couldn't bend it. Going down the stairs just took forever. And I was terrified. I was like, oh my god, because I couldn't, I can't even use a crutch because this arm, it, it hurt more last week, but it's kind of like one day it's better, one day it's worse. Like yesterday, it was just terrible, you know? And, and like there'd be no way I could put a, a thing in there. You know, I've taken a lot of Advil today so I can like move it around some and, you know, but like if I try to pick up anything with weight, it feels stronger now because I took the Advil, it loosens up over the day. And then in the morning, it's like, it's basically kind of frozen like this. And if I go like this or like this, it, it hurts. You know? but yeah, I was like, I can't even use a crutch. Because <laughs> my, my hand's not strong enough to hold it. And my armpit's all screwed up. My shoulder's all screwed up. Like, I just wouldn't be able to do it. So, But luckily, it started to feel better. But now, the last, well... Yesterday, today, knee is killing me. I look like a fool at work, you know. Uh, anybody looking at me would have known. My, 
I was working all around guys I didn't know, you know. Uh, first time working with this crew of guys and, um, from different, you know, carpenters and floor guys and stuff. And so they might just think that's the way I am. <laughs> and maybe from now on, maybe that, that will be the way I am. Anyway, uh, the reason I felt like making this video is because I, one of the nice things about stopping drinking is I spent a lot of time over the weekend starting my vegan cross book, which I've determined is a goal. I have to do it. It has to be done. It would be great if tomorrow someone else made a better one and published it so I didn't have to do it. Because I'm like sick to my stomach reading the Bible. It's not that I don't need the Bible or whatever, or different lessons, but, you know. I'm pretty steeped in a lot of things, and there are things that I've experienced that don't have answers there, and I found the answers elsewhere. Having found the answers elsewhere, and then over time, I can see that in the Bible. When people are talking about things and it just sounds kind of poetic or this or that or whatever. And it's like, no, I, I know what that is. But I never would have, I never would have, like, found it there. And I never would have found the resolutions that I found elsewhere. And I'm talking survival. I ain't talking, like, crazy Jeff, black magic, weirdo fucking shit. yeah it just kind of drives me nuts and just the language and so on and so and I really want people who not not everybody would like this book and that's if I do it right if I do a great job it'll be for a relatively small audience but I'm hoping that small audience can take the message and spread it in words that fit better with that culture because that culture that culture I know I'm stereotyping but anybody who's critical of that culture knows exactly what I mean and if you're part of that culture and you don't it's a problem but anyway starting my vegan cross book I've decided for the time being on the name Flora actually I'll just show this a little I, uh, I hook my computer up to my TV so the screen's bigger and I can read it easier. Yeah, that's the, whoops, flora. And then the next page, oh yeah, and then it says vegan cross at the bottom of that page. And then the next page, I like this part. I do not sit at meat. Little, little cross there. Anyway, so that's the first couple pages. And then at the bottom of this page, I decided last night to put on Beware, this is a horrible book. Mostly meaning like people want to read about like Christian y Jesus stuff, you know? It's pretty much. I don't know, it just seems like what I'm writing is kind of a bummer. And I want to be able to really kind of get into it more. I'm not really, I'm not going to be able to go to half the depth, not a quarter of the depth that I'd really like to go to if I was right if I was writing it for me. But I'm not. I'm considering the audience. I'm trying to put, or I will try to put pieces of everything I'd really like to cover in there, so that it's available. But if I wrote it for me, no one would. It wouldn't be effective. And I'm writing this to be effective. Like, this isn't some pet project or something I want to show my family. I'd be terrified, mortified to show my family. They're, they're going to fucking hate it. And that's if I do a good job. <clears throat> so. But it's something that needs to be said. And it's not being said. So I got to try. I mean, it needs to be said. <coughs> Anyway, before I start working on it tonight, I didn't have much I wanted to do, but uh, there were a couple things. 
maybe just a few sentences. So I got 45 minutes. Oh yeah, and before I start, what a perfect, perfect time for, this is the rest of my kombucha with all the dregs in it. It's from one of them big bottles. They get a lot of dregs. I'll put a little water in it to try to mellow it out a little bit. I know that's backwards, but whatever. A sacrifice where nothing is killed. A concept that is spread around the world, even though people don't realize that's exactly what it fucking is. From a time, from when before, and at that time, ritualized magic, multi-god sacrifices were happening around the world. And before that, just all over, you know. It's arguable that that's still the same case today, especially if you have a piece of a body in front of you and you pray over it. You know, people think they're praying to God and don't realize that's, that's, it's black magic. It ain't good. But people don't know. For most people, it, I guess you could say it's, it's a low level, they don't even realize it. Um, but it's a global phen phenomenon. All that shit adds up. <laughs> and it's a good chunk of the monster that we're fighting. People don't realize it. All the strife, everything that's between people, all that, just the horribleness of the world and this and that, all that shit. And this human and that human and this population, that population, this neighbor, that neighbor, all that shit. But we get this problem, we get that problem. We have a problem, we have a problem with violence, you know, we have a problem with suicide. We've got a problem with drugs. We've got a problem, you know, between this group and this group and that group and that group. We have a problem in this city. We have a problem in this community. We have a problem in this household. You know. These these parents are fighting. These divorced people are fighting. The, the, this kid and this parent don't get along. They don't get... All of that is inextricably tied to eating meat. We're infecting the spiritual realm. And a lot of time when bad shit's going on, there's an ether there is you know, dark energy dark matter all that particles flying through us at every moment <laughs> there's a lot of shit going on and all those incarnate souls being released violently from their body day after 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 day. It's a fucking wonder there's any world left, man. It might be more of an infection within the spiritual realm than everything else bad that humans do against each other, wars. Because you have to think of the sheer magnitudes the magnitudes of meat. It's incomprehensible. It used to be like... I forget I forget what it was before COVID, and I don't know if this was worldwide or just in the West or whatever, but like 50 billion chickens a day. Billion. Or 50 billion chickens a year. Maybe more than that. But that's just what what's counted in some little statistics and that's just the chickens, never mind the beef and the this and that and plus all the hunting and then just it makes us cruel, just a regular cruelty to animals and a lot of people think roadkill is you know, defenseless now I'm not saying like, we gotta stop driving so there won't be, that's not what I'm saying but what I'm saying is that shit's real, there are consequences But it could be argued that all of that in the spiritual realm is a bigger problem than everything else we do to each other. 
everything. Rape, murder, incest. I'm even talking about that because there's so fucking much of it. All the shit, bad shit humans do to each other is like a base camp on the top of a mountain of slaughter. Never mind what other animals do to each other. That's an entire fucking continent of slaughter. We're the only ones who can change it. We're the only ones who can make a difference, and it would make a difference in the entire fucking cosmos. Anyway. All right. So yeah, I'm just, I just started working on this. I'm, who knows, I might not use any of this. I'll definitely change it. I'm back and forth over it already like 20 times this weekend. Sorry I get like this. But I'm glad to be kind of excited about doing something without being wasted. So that's kind of cool. Bear with me. I'm getting nervous. I know these gotta go. I'm, I am very scared about that. I got some Nicorette gum I've, I've had around for like a year. Late spring, early summer, I tried chewing on that a little bit to tone things down. And it worked okay for a few days. I'm, I'm in bad shape. And I need to alkalize. Like, severely. Which is a bummer too that winter's coming. Coming because being alkaline in the winter is not necessarily good for people who aren't used to being alkaline. If you live in a cold environment, it, it can be better to be more basic because it keeps you warm. You gotta keep that, you know, internal heater going. And I got problems with that too. <laughs> I guess it's just kind of finally time to stop thinking about these things and do them. And I'm gonna have to take it to another level, level if I want it to work. You know, alkaline healing, all that kind of stuff. It is, I have in big letters, it's, it's a Parmenides reference, you know. I figured if a philosophical-minded person opens up the book and sees it is, like a philosopher would know that that's a Parmenides reference, and that might get them. Not that this book is necessarily for them, but I want them to see what I'm doing, because this book isn't just for Christian people, it's for atheists to understand enough of the scripture to make the argument. so that they can convert, help convert religious people to vegans. And they might, why would I want to do that? Because if religious, if the Christian religious community is not converted in a, in a massive movement to veganism, just the domino effect, the, it's like, it sounds crazy, but it's a key component for their survival of civili civilization and manifestations of the Holy Ghost in this world. I'm telling you. Anyway, it is tempting to start at the beginning, but this tale meets us where we are. It strikes us all at once as it struck our parents and theirs. We forget. The word comes at us out of nowhere, hits us like a wall, wham! Then, just stands there. Thank God, in immutable silence, lest we die of fright beneath, beneath its towering reach. I'm terrible at talking. Nothing can prepare us for the shock. Even at the feet of its stillness, we are beset with a daunting, magnificent, and utterly, <clears throat> utterly horrifying truth. The story of stories may find us at the age of three years, or thirteen, or thirty. It may come from pages in the book, or from the pages 
of life. Either way, even the slightest touch of God's truth will bulldoze every lie. We find ourselves in the rubble, raw and feeble, asking, why have you called out and chosen wretched me? Too often, similar rhetoric is used to inspire or instigate fervent or raucous praise and passionate testimonies. Though my intent is otherwise, because the meanings I ascribe to these particular words here are different. God's world. Our world. The world that occupies the place where God isn't. No matter who's in charge or how you slice it, we live in a butcherous world. We humans have it easy. Yes, even we who have the luxury to despair. All animals despair. We despair as they do. But an animal that remains in despair will soon die, while humans at least have the chance for long suffering. In the natural kingdom, when an animal is met with despair, the only choice survival allows is to become a fully functioning psychopath. Murderous, awake with fear, and always on the run. God's beautiful dream is unfulfilled in our populations, ecosystems ruled by grand nightmares of the horrible tooth. So long as incarnate souls kill and eat, eat other incarnate souls, the dream will be only that, a dream, and the nightmare will continue to prosper. For us, people, it will be mostly that, a nightmare, infecting the spirit and the mind. For animals, for beasts, for other incarnate souls, it is much worse. The nightmare is a real life, real time killing spree in broad daylight. A beautiful sunrise cannot save them from the mouth that awaits in the valley or on the mountaintop. The mouth that will chew them to bits beside the stream or in a field of wildflowers. The whole universe, the entire cosmos, is helpless to this fact. All but helpless, that is. There are only two things that can possibly stand in the way of the unholy hunger. One is God, if you believe in God, and the other is us, whether you believe or not. If we don't tackle this monster, nothing else will. Nothing else can. Our stewardship is a mandate, and killing is its greatest betrayal. The jury is out. The circle of life is a lie. We are meant to spire. Animals always on the run abandon love soon after birth. They have no choice, but that is not, that is not their nature. Rescued animals and those in sanctuary act very differently in a safe and loving environment. Maybe lions will lay with lambs after all, someday, but not without our help. First though, we must purge the human form and family of its titanic crime. Wild and free? Hardly. Even the king of the jungle, the mighty lion, lives a most miserable life. Male, male lions are killed by their fathers or the lions that killed their fathers. Dominant males, having aged, will likely be killed by one of their own sons. Those outside the pride will be killed by their intended prey or starvation and despair. King of the jungle? No. The vicious bully spends his day in the sun with his murderous harem and soon falls to the tooth and claw himself. This is no victory. He is no king nor hero. Now imagine, whether you believe in such things or not, an enlightened soul trapped in a wild animal's body, a doe, a sloth, a raccoon. What friends have they? Imagine, if you can stomach it, a furry saint in communion with the Most High, peering through times, breaching thresholds and beholding the great unknown. For her, what recourse, what repose? A peaceful minority walk the boundaries between the forests and the fields as wild turkeys in search of a few safe moments, then run and hide at the first sign, even a hint of very real monsters nipping at their heels. Truly, no peaceful place to rest their head. They succumb to sleep only when nagging fear is consumed by exhaustion. If these little ones are lucky or blessed, they wake refreshed, 
to flee their attackers for one more day and survive the great mouth of this world once again. Until finally someday, for most, the monster and its terrible mouth takes them away. Complete horror is their parting gift. There's no happy ending to this story. Not yet. It is tempting to start at the beginning, but we must start where we are. And where we are is the crux of the situation, and the crux of the situation is a 2,000-year-old open secret. Theologians and scholars and storytellers pore over the pages, flip over stones, dive deep between the words, or skim weightlessly across the surface. Meanwhile, right before our eyes, in the midst of this breathtaking mystery, there's a door. The door has not been hidden. The door has not been locked. In fact, there's no door at all, but a doorway. Armies have not battled to find this doorway. Great powers of wealth have not sought to buy or steal it. The intelligentsia has not secured it. It's as if they can't see it. And if they do see it, they give it no notice and deem it worthless. This great treasure meant to enrich the kingdom and inhabit many mansions of the house. Capital H house. Working on it. Who was it who said too many read themselves stupid? Yes, and right likewise. <laughs> I'm talking about myself there. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a total idiot to figure out an obvious truth because an idiot has no capacity for anything else. I don't mean to diminish the mystery, awe, and beauty of unraveling the rich nested layers of context and meaning in religious study and worship. I cherish these things. My deepest concern, however, is for the authority, the forthright power of the explicit moral. Story is king. Its moral reigns. The moral of the story is the story. Embedded truths stand most securely upon explicit truth. By now you know what I'm up to and I'm already embarrassed for not saying it simpler and sooner. I prayed for daily bread and, and an eagle fell on my plate. Okay then, just a minute while I grab my sword. I'll have to clean this up, I'll have to clean up this mess before I eat. Aspiration, kill, butchery. The war of peace is a brutal war. All that has come before have been battles in preparation for the great sorrow. The war of peace and its apocalyptic scope has only recently, just now, become life. Never again will the Lord of Hosts hide its face or mask its true, true ambition. The troops will gather and the ranks will swell, and the war will reach its fullness in a swift history until it is over. Swift as history's go, but for us it may seem a long war, a long while indeed. The war of peace is the war for peace. The peace that God gives is the greatest peace, but it quickly decomposes here in the world. God's peace is a gift. We are meant to return the favor. So who wages this war? Who fights it? The truth is, if we don't fight it, then the war will not be fought. If we, you and me, do not rage against the darkness, then the eternal night will prevail. And a small heaven will be presided over by a lonely, heartbroken God. To kill an idea is to kill a ghost. We forgive the butcher. He is not our enemy. He is our brother. We war against principalities, living thought forms, dynamic and aware and untouchable. How can we slay what we cannot see or touch? It will take a miracle. And it will. And we're going to help. So long as butchery thrives by our hand, there will be no peace between us. The inequality and degradation that exists between persons and peoples is inextricably linked, part and parcel, to the blood we spill in the name of taste. The abundance we are meant for cannot be found at the back door of the slaughterhouse. We cannot build a just house on the burnt flesh and broken bones of the weak. We are the good shepherds, remember? 
I don't hate you. I'm not blaming you. I'm here to help. I need help too. Things are different now than they were before. We have this choice. We must make the right choice and turn from ferocity to forgiveness. Easier said than done, I know all too well. But saying so seems to help. I do not sit at meat. That's how I started this off. And the philologists are already in an uproar. This phrase is my own, reinterpreted from Luke 22, 27, King James Bible. Jesus' Jesus's words, He that sitteth at meat. In Luke's account of what we call the Last Supper is a peculiar translation unique to the King James Bible, a bold augmentation of the original line, something akin to he who reclines at the table, meaning he who eats or one who eats at the table. So why these words, he that sitteth at meat and I do not sit at meat? Whether or not the saying was a colloquialism, the choice was deliberate and provided emph emphasis for the careful reader. Why? To make a sharp impression, to make a point. He that sitteth at meat. Once read, spoken, and heard, it's a dark saying that's hard to shake. I do not sit at meat. Please consider, if you will, that the most popular version of the most popular story in the most widespread language ever is a very real thing, physically, metaphysically, spiritually, magically. Woe, ye scribes and Pharisees, for changing jots and tittles. Yes. And yea, ye good conspirators with truth who change them back. True, there are many hidden mysteries in Scripture, confounding questions with real and dangerous answers. We will give them little thought here. The mystery is to be sought, but not for adventure's sake alone. We must find answers, solutions. We do not seek for an adventure, but for the truth. If adventure ensues with its perils and glories while pursuing truth, or after having found truth, well, so be it. Fleeing a common notion, the reason for this journey is the destination. In our case, the purpose of this narrative is not to submerge ourselves in hidden depths, but to simply read and clarify what stands before us for all to see revealed starkly in black and white. The cross has hit us all at once. We bend beneath its weight. I pray I do not buckle. I pray I do not break. Until the work is done. Low as I am, may the spark have been given like the fire in my heart heart that burns for eternal love, low as I am, frightened by my own lofty words, frightened of hope, may I stand fast and brave the gift of faith in the face of these fears and other fears also, no matter what comes. One last thing before we begin in earnest. What's the forbid forbidden fruit? Again, we find the billions dumbfounded by an impenetrable mystery the clergy says nothing to help, do they know? Yet poetic ruminations aside, value as valuable as they may be, we are left with the simplest of answers. A dim child can tell it right away. While doctors hem and haw, what is the forbidden fruit, for God's sake, what is it? That's easy. What do serpents, snakes, and dragons eat? The answer is simple. The answer is easy. But its truth is very, very, very hard. God be with you. Be careful. See you on the battlefield. May the dream flourish. So that's kind of, I guess, maybe kind of like a preface. And then it starts. 
fits into it. I've got kind of a big title up top, then a quote from Isaiah, and then I go. Holy Supper. Holy Supper. And then the quote from Isaiah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he goats. Isaiah 111. The Last Supper, that's what we call it. A funny misnomer, considering Jesus never ate that day, and he makes a point to say so. Is Da Vinci to blame, that old rascal? Well, we gotta call it something. And who would dare call it the last Passover? The last Passover has slipped between our fingers. What he did. I'm boggled, beside myself, flabbergasted. And I don't know whether to praise God for hiding truth, to be found in plain text, over tens of hundreds of years, or to give the devil his due for blinding everyone to the story in front of us as we read words that disappear before our mind's eyes as soon as we see them, as though we never saw them, as if they weren't there at all. Our blindness to this matter is the miracle in our midst that we are blind to. I'm going to say that again. Our blindness to this matter is the miracle in our midst that we're blind to. Remarkable. Unbelievable. Inconceivable. Crazy. Perfect. In all the careful study, books and books and books and books, library after library, sermon after sermon, it never comes up. The most significant detail of that most significant supper. What does come up? The Eucharist, Holy Communion, Monday, Thursday, or was it Tuesday? The body and the blood of Christ, the symbol of Christ's sacrifice, eternal life. Is it really the blood and the body or just a symbol? I really want to make sure I don't blow this eternal life thing. And from outside the church, outside all the churches, a resounding, nay. Protestants and Catholics butt heads. Christians butt heads with atheists, agnostics, Jews, Muslims, and with philosophers of the West and each, West, West and East. Not to mention regular folk caught up in the mix or disregarded altogether. Minor points of doctrine become inflated to God-sized proportions. Arbitrary arguments are given center stage. Fingers point in every direction, and accusations of blasphemy and condemnations of heresy are proclaimed shamelessly by every voice. The church, the congregation, has become anemic to its own purpose. It has done all it can do. The appeal of its moral authority will continue to bleed away into the secular sea. Of course, the term morality gets battered around with the term ethics a lot. Wordsmiths and philosophers love to toss those words around, and secularists have done quite a number on various historical proclamations of morality, of false or hypocritical so-called mor morality, and for good reason. I am all for removing tyrants from their thrones and false prophets from their pulpits, but most of the high-minded debate between morality and ethics is silly nonsense, as inane and nonsensical, as fierce multi -central, mul a fierce multi-century battle over whether metaphor or simile is the superior literary device, which is absurd. Nobody would ever stand for it. Most five-year-olds are over the chocolate versus vanilla argument by the time they are six. Don't misunderstand me, I love playing with, with words, studying them, learning their sources and evolutions over time. I'm a I'm constantly embarrassed I don't know more words and more about them. But that game will not deliver the iron and oxygen to the blood of the body of Christ. The entire Christian corpus has, has had all the tradition, intellectual, doctrinal, cuisine it can stand. It's time to take a breath, stand back, and observe simple truths with fresh eyes and ears using simple words that everyone can understand and agree upon. It is time for nutritive ideas that are easy for the mind to digest. It is time for a serving of spinach, or better, better yet, amaranth, and breath, breath, breath.
it is time for an, another look at the moral of the story. Let's get it right this time. And I guess maybe uh, this reminds me I should add here that um, I'm, you know, I'm in favor of all picking things apart. But if you don't get the moral of the story, if you get the moral of the story light right, then it shines a light on all the symbolism, all of it else. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, there are a lot of morals to the story. But what he did in that Last Supper, man. And then crucified as the lamb. Like, it's not just symbolic. It's, he's stepping in, in place for them. We think he's saving us. He saved a fuck. You, know, you could say, or, or the idea is, he saved a fucking lamb that day. He died for a fucking A lamb. He was sacrificed and the lamb wasn't. Or I guess it's Rome, so a bull wasn't. You know what I'm saying? Like, really, for real. Not, not just, like, for real. Did he say, did he come for us? Did he not come for us? Don't know. You know, or you know what I'm saying? That's, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is, I mean, the 2000 year history is actually a proof. Right? There are things that weren't stated that have been proven over time. And now that we're at this time, we get, we get this piece, right? Poof, fucking light, bro. <clears throat> I forget what I was saying. Let me start reading again. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think I got enough time. The church. The con okay, no, I got all that part. God has not evolved, so to speak, but we have intellectually, spiritually, technologically, and socially, we have evolved a lot. Some time-honored traditions have served their purpose and their time has come and gone. We, can't, we cling to them, fearing that letting them go will take us in the wrong direction, another step away from God. But we have evolved precisely in all these capacities to let go of some spent traditions in order to take a giant leap closer to God. And not just the traditions of the church, but the greater milieu of family traditions among the faithful. First on the chopping block, what I'm f referring to specifically, a Thanksgiving turkey, a Christmas goose, an Easter ham, a Passover lamb, a pot roast potluck, a big juicy steak, a cheeseburger for every occasion. Those days are over. All that's left, all that's left are caricatures of walking dead traditions that no longer symbolize or commemorate anything of value whatsoever. It is different now because the revelation has begun as it was written. I'm not talking brimstone and fire, but that will come if we fuck it up. All will be revealed, yes, but slow down. First things first. Enough grandstanding. Enough prefacing and setting a tone. Let's get into it. Please forgive my pride and arrogance. Please permit me to say my piece. I'm a simple man who walks a short patrol at the boundary of belief. There are no outposts here. I guess you could say, I'm the outpost. The boundary is hot and both sides are losing control. I'm no saint. Within my limitations, I submit to you a report. I send it unsealed to every strata between me and the inner sanctum. I send it unsealed to every strata between me and the far reaches of disbelief. I don't know how it will be received, but I know this much. The disbelievers hate the language I use and the believers hate the way I use it. As for me, I hate it more. Believers and disbelievers are words used to construct a false dichotomy created by the self-proclaimed believers. In theory, such a line could be drawn, but in practice it has colored way outside the lines. From the opposite perspective, disbelievers become rationalists and believers become irrational. The great mass of self-proclaimed rationalists barely have a rational bone in their body, yet they make persuasive and sometimes ac accurate critiques of the irrational practicing religious types in their archaic myths. Another false start. Once again, please forgive my pride and arrogance. Hello? Anyone? 
Luke 22, 7 through 20, English Standard Version. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it, and he, as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table, and the, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this, and divide it amongst yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let me boil down the central theological innovation. Passover. Kill lamb. Get ready to eat it. Hey, where'd the lamb go? We no longer sacrifice the lamb and pray over its barbecued corpse. I've come to save the sheep. Literally. Stop killing lambs and baby goats and oxen and each other in my name. Stop eating forbidden fruit to save your ass from the angel of death. Follow me to hell to destroy every unholy demon to kill death itself to kill butchery. It won't be pretty. I am the last Passover sacrifice. I am the slain lamb. You are not my sheep. You are my children. And so are the sheep. Remember me. See it now? The kingdom of God remains unfulfilled. And it's our fault. So yeah, that's how far I got. Seems as I took some liberties there with um, the passage that I chose. I took passage, then I did a synopsis. But that's because right after that, then I'm going to go back and describe, you know, Passover, Angel of Death, Exodus type stuff. I'm going to kind of bounce between those some. And what else? There was one other thing. Oh, yeah, and another thing about that passage, Luke 22, 7 through 20, which is kind of the most extensive piece of this story it's just kind of like lumped in you know and then like before and after it it's talking about judas so like hugh it's like hidden between all this other shit and it's and they're getting ready you know and, and if you're reading it then you then you're getting ready to see what's coming and and then and then in the other in the other in the other books you know uh, matthew mark like it's it's like this fucking long it's like there's nothing it's like a they went to kill, they were going to kill, kill the lamb, a couple other things, then they ate bread and they ate wine, da da da, that's it, you know, and, I mean, there's, so it like totally almost gets lost, but, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed, in, in the other books it's, it's translated, or in the other of the books it's translated, killed, <coughs> killed, <coughs> killed and uh yeah and then he gives them wine and bread and that's the power of when people take the sacrament communion the eucharist whatever your tradition like you're going when you go to a mass when you go to church it's a ritual there are ritualistic elements and you know especially Orthodox or Catholic churches, it's very ritualized for a reason. And some people harsh on it, being like, ah, oh, it's a sacrifice, you know. 
but it is one of the greatest innovations in cosmological history. Nothing like it had ever been done before, and nothing like it has been done since. Picture yourself at church the way we picture ourselves at church, and then imagine an animal sacrifice. And that's another thing about it, too. If you go to an animal sacrifice, and there's a hundred bulls slain, and you're 10 years old, 12 years old, maybe 18 years old, but it opens up a door, or it can, but it puts you in a different state, it puts you in a different vibration, and if you're of a certain kind of person spiritually, it can blow open fucking doors, portals. Jesus put all of that into a piece of bread. All of that, like, he put all of it. It's the good news, man. We don't got to kill lamb no more. It doesn't come up. But once you see it, you can't unsee it. Do this in remembrance of me. Not this. Huge. Huge. Obviously. It's fucking huge, man. And the church doesn't even realize that that's what it is starving for. That little itty bitty twitch of an understanding. Change what you shop at at the grocery store and the whole fucking world will start to change. in ways you won't believe. The dragon, once, no, even well before there's critical mass, at about 11%, somewhere between 11 and 15% worldwide population, the devil's gonna fucking, or the dragon, or what I like to think of as the accumulated thought form, accumulated erroneous free will choices conglomerated within the ether, not quite the ether, between the ether and plasma. <laughs> As, uh, yeah, living thought forms, second order, diamonds. And, uh, yeah, it'll start kicking. But soul of the Holy Ghost, man. Anyway, that's it.